Well, let me read the passage. We're starting in verse 10 of chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplications. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that my that words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So that you may know that how I am and what I'm doing, Tychus, our beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Over these weeks, we looked at six attitudes that grow out of all the ways God has blessed us and worked in our lives and reframed our identity in him. And then for the last two weeks, we've looked at four commitments that we make in refocusing our efforts so that we walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. We finish this this morning by looking at the, sixth, the fifth and sixth commitments, the fifth which is a commitment to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. Now Paul begins this section with the word finally. All he has written prior to this is, is summed up in an action step, a crucial action step he wants us to take, which is simply to be strong in the strength of the Lord and the strength of his might. Strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Then in these following verses, he elaborates what that looks like. And don't rush past this command. It sums up all that has gone before. If we reframe our identity based on what's laid out in chapters 1 through 3, and if we refocus our efforts, aligning them with the commitments in chapters 4, 5, and 6, we will stand firm in the strength of the Lord. Now, those who live driven lives have been described in 414, so that you may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Now, this is the opposite of standing firm. Those apart from Christ want to stand firm. They work on and driven to do that, but they can't stand firm because the winds and the waves they created by their deceits the deceits on which they've ground their lives prevent them from doing that. Their old self-identity, which is described in 421, and their unfruitful deeds of darkness, those efforts described in 511, prevent them from ever finding a place to stand firm. To use Jesus' word picture from Mark, uh, Matthew, Matthew 7, they build their house on shifting sand, not on the solid rock of Christ. They cannot stand firm against the winds and the waves of this world, but we can. Now, Paul penetrates the surface realities of this world and the powers behind the storm that assails all of us. And he writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
We live in a fallen world, and apart from the church, this world is under Satan's control. As this verse states, these powers are against us. They seek to knock us down and take us out of the game. I mean, think about it. Why is it Why is it that so many in, in the West seem to bend over backwards not to offend Muslims, but it's okay to slander and persecute Christians? In some elementary schools, kids are being taught Muslim prayers, but you dare not bring a Bible to class or even mention that December holiday known as Christmas. More Christians have been martyred in the 20th century and even more so in the 21st century than all other centuries combined. Now chapter two, verse two clarifies this reality. If you remember it says, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. One of my church history professors, Richard Lovelace, made a wonderful comment one time, really sums this all up when he simply said that the church is a beachhead in enemy-occupied territory. Now, Revelation 12 describes what's going on here. There's a drama there that unfolds. It involves a pregnant woman who is Israel, a child to be born who is Jesus, and a great red dragon who is Satan. Now, Satan is unable to thwart Jesus. And then he cannot destroy this woman after she gives birth, and the woman after she gives birth becomes us, the church. And verse 17 sums up how furious Satan is about being defeated. And this is, what, this is how the text responds. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, that's us, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand, on the stand of the sea, which is the end of chapter 12. Chapter 13, which begins by describing the beast from the sea, kind of goes like this. From standing there on the beach, Satan calls forth the beast of the sea. Now, the best understanding we have of what the beast of the sea is, he is the entire world system throughout history determined to destroy the church. This system does so, the text says, by uttering haughty and blasphemous words, is allowed to exercise authority and to make war on the saints and extinguish them and conquer them. Again, why is it so hard to be the church? Why are so many people indifferent at best and hostile at worst towards Christians? Why does it always seem that the playing field is tilted against us? Well, as Lovelace said, we are, the church is a beachhead in enemy-occupied territory. In this text, we're called to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. That's Jesus, who, as the prayer in chapter 3 affirms, dwells in our hearts through faith, roots us and grounds us in his surpassing love, fills us all the fullness of, with all the fullness of God. And this is the God who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Now, as I said earlier, talking about a locus, eternal locus of control, when our well-being is located inside us, nothing outside us can threaten or diminish that well-being. The power at work within us, which is the spirit of Jesus, gives us the ability to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. Now, the crucial life-determining question we face each day is simply, in whose strength am I going to operate today? My own or the Lord's? If we try to handle our day in our own strength, we'll be tempted to operate from those old identities and efforts that drove us. If we allow the Lord and his strength to handle our days, we're living out of that reframed identity and refocused efforts that enable us to stand firm against all 
and every assault that comes against us. No adversity will throw us. No unmet expectation will discourage us. No offense will devalue us. Whose strength we choose make all the difference. I don't know if you're aware, but last week was the first week I really felt strong doing the class. The previous three weeks, I was, I was feeling somewhat fatigued. And I got up last Sunday morning feeling very fatigued. And I was really anxious and concerned whether I'd have enough strength to do the class last week. And so Carol and I prayed 2 Corinthians 12, 9, which says, but Paul said, but the Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in, my, in your weakness. And I said, Lord, you have a lot of room to work this morning. <laughs> and I prayed, Lord, thank you that I'll have your strength to do the class, and I did. <clears throat> Whose strength we choose makes all the difference. Now, the pieces of armor described here are instructive. They give us helpful word pictures of the equipment God provides in our battle against all that might stand against us, human and demonic. The first three, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes for our feet, which are the readiness given by the gospel of peace, make us invulnerable. The attacks of the enemy can't touch us. God's belt of truth equips us to reject all of Satan's lies. The breastplate of righteousness dis, dis, excuse me, discern, disarms all accusations that we aren't right with God. The next two the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation keep us rightly focused. All that sets, Paul says set before us in the first three chapters spell out what it means for Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. In faith, we believe all the good news of the gospel. All that's spelled out in Scripture, what we have in Jesus. And when our focus is on Jesus, we're not even aware of as the text says, the flaming darts of the enemy. Those darts are designed to create doubt in, in our minds and fear in our hearts. They accuse us that we're inadequate, that we're unlovable, and those darts keep us stuck in shame, hiding from each other and from God, and that's been true since Adam and Eve hid in the bushes, hiding from the God that was seeking them. Now, the helmet of salvation protects the vital parts, which is our thinking. Now, salvation expressed our total experience with Jesus. He's called us to himself and to a life described in 5.7, where it says, At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And living in the warmth of his light, seeing his light shine out from our lives is so good that any thought of returning to the darkness is absolutely abhorrent to us. Focused on his light, walking in his light, we're not even aware. We don't entertain the thoughts of anything dark. The last two, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and praying at all times in the spirit with all prayers and supplications for the saint, are offensive weapons. They're how we do battle. Prayer, and God's word is how we do battle. Now, the classic example of wielding the sword of the spirit, the word of God, is Jesus' temptation. A number of years ago, I was at a Promise Keepers rally in Denver, and E.V. Hill, a tremendous black preacher from Los Angeles, was preaching. And he titled his sermon, How to Talk to the Devil. And all he said was, hit him with scripture. And it was a powerful message. The next year, I was also back at Folsom Field at University of Colorado. Evil Hill walked out to preach. And every guy, all 50,000 guys in the place stood up and said, hit him, hit him, hit him. <laughs> it was a great moment. But it made the point. What did Jesus do in his temptation? Satan accused him, tempted him, and Jesus replied, it is said, and quoted scripture. And God's truth cut through and totally disarmed Satan. The classic example of prayer is Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. The battle to go to the cross was won in the garden in prayer. 
If you notice, after Gethsemane, you see a Jesus whose will is firmly and inexorably set to go to the cross, and he doesn't miss any step up the hill called Calvary. I remember watching the uh, wonderful filming of the Gospel of Matthew, called the Gospel of Matthew by the Visual Bible. If you ever get a chance to see that, it is absolutely wonderful. It is, the text is nothing but the... The words in the film are nothing but the text of Matthew. And Bruce Marciano, who plays Jesus, you watch him getting to the cross. And he's stumbling. And he's crawling. And his eyes are always on the cross. Because he knows that's where he's supposed to be. The battle for Calvary wasn't won on Calvary. It was won in the garden in prayer. And as the church has said for decades and centuries, prayer is not preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. Now, the first five pieces defend us. The last two attack the enemy and defeat him. And don't miss the fact that prayer and Bible study are spirit-empowered, as the text says. Our Bible is the sword of the Spirit. Prayer, the text says, is in the Spirit. And both of those engage the Holy Spirit. He's in us. He's working out of us. And if you were a demon, would you want to take him on? I sure wouldn't. Now, as reflecting on this is an experience I had that I think describes what it means to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. And it looks like the combat veterans I served with in Vietnam. A number of these men and I trained together. We also went to Vietnam on the same day in January of 1971. We also left Vietnam on exactly the same day, December 16, 1971. And the contrast between those men prior to going into combat and after was startling. As we were going to Vietnam, we were anxious and uncertain. Would we be equal to the challenge? Could we stand up to a determined enemy? And then I saw these men a month, 12 months later, and there was a quiet confidence about them. They had nothing to prove. They had taken on a determined enemy and prevailed. They had trusted their training, they trusted their commander, and they won. A determined enemy threw everything they had at them and couldn't defeat them. My friend stood firm, and I think that's a good example of what it means to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. We will as well. The goal Paul presents is to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. The action step is to put on, to take up the whole armor of God. That means those armor pieces are lying on the ground, right in front of us, as it were, and we're called to pick them up and put them on. God has provided all we need to stand firm. Now, everything Paul has written to us in Ephesians so far tells us what's involved. A reframed identity in Christ, refocus efforts that live our commitment to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. So the question simply is each morning, in whose strength will I operate today? My own strength or the strength of the Lord? A commitment to stand firm in the strength of the Lord means I acknowledge God's strength, acknowledge my utter dependence on him, and choose his strength for this day. It means, as Ephesians 1, 18 to 22 declares, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of, uh, working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And put all things under his feet and gave him as head over everything to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. The exalted risen Christ is sovereign over the universe. There is no competing power that could even come within light years of taking him on. But notice as well what it says in chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show his the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. All that the Father accomplished through Jesus, all that Jesus accomplished, means not only does Jesus have authority over every competing power, but we do as well, because we're seated with him in heavenly places. And if demonic powers are under his feet, they're under ours. Remember a number of years ago, going through a seminar with uh, Eddie Servoso, who was an Argentine evangelist and pastor, who was instrumental in a tremendous revival that happened in Argentina a number of years ago than in other South American countries. And Eddie's, uh, I think, insight into all of this simply was, before Satan will release those he holds captive, that he has to be defeated in warfare prayer in heavenly places. And as he described that, he talked about where they, where they are and where we are. And he drew a picture of a, of a man, which was Jesus, and, and another man beside him. And all the demons were underneath their feet. And that's the point. We have authority over these de demonic powers. The word picture is very simple. We are soldiers in a battle we've already won. All we have to do is take up the armor of God provides and battle in his strength. It all comes down to where we place our confidence. Hear what the Lord says in Jeremiah 9. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Let me reread that with one word change. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man put confidence in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man put confidence in his might. Let not the rich man put confidence in his riches. But let him put confidence in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. It all comes down to in whose strength will I live today? In whose strength will I take my stand, my own or the Lord? If we choose to do it in our own strength, we'll be tempted to work out of all those old drives that drove us. If we do so in the Lord, we will live in the strength of those six, six blessed, fueled attitudes we looked at in the first six chapters. We'll focus on walking worthy of the calling to which we've been called in those six commitments. We'll do that, and we will not be driven by our own inadequate strengths. The final word in this to us is simply, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Any questions on these verses? Any thoughts? Any brilliant insights from the Lord? Well, let's move on to the second half. Lesson 12 is a commitment to bold evangelism. From all that Paul focuses on after the demonic, focusing on that, he then goes on and prays for himself. And he specifically asks that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now the best understanding of Paul's life situation when he writes this is that he's in prison, he's in Rome, he's awaiting his trial before Caesar. And the entire might of the Roman Empire and the satanic powers behind it are against him. He's praying that God would give him the ability in that context, in his trial, and everything going on around it, to boldly proclaim the gospel of Christ. We need to rehearse what Ephesians says about the world in which we live out our calling. Chapter 2, following the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience, those who gratify the cravings of their sinful nature following its desires and thoughts. Chapter 4, those who operate with human cunning, craftiness, deceitful scheming, 
Gentiles whose thinking is futile, who are darkened in their understanding, separated from the light of God, whose hearts are hardened and corrupted by deceitful desires, who practice falsehood, rage, anger, abuse, slander, and malice. Chapter 5. Those who are sexually immoral, impure, greedy, who give themselves up to obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking, idolatrous, disobedient, who live in darkness doing fruitless deeds and shameful practice, those who are drunk. Chapter 6. A world controlled by rulers, authorities, powers of this present darkness, evil and heavenly realms who shoot flaming darts of the evil one. In this darkened world, we are called to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Chapter 5 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. The text says we're called to keep alert with all perseverance because we live in a world determined to extinguish the light of those of us who are the children of light. And you still we're called to shine as light in this dark world. To live as light is to boldly proclaim the mystery of the gospel. Now, in the New Testament, a mystery isn't a puzzle to be solved. It's a truth that cannot be known until someone explains it. Paul mentions this in chapter 3, 8, and 9. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, for which, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. My friends, if we don't tell them, they'll never figure it out. So how do we tell them? How do we shine as light in a dark world? Well, first, we live out of those six attitudes that in chapters 1 through 3. These attitudes are in sharp contrast to the driven world. And so as those called out by Christ, we live with joyful praise in a world that envies. We live with confident hope in a world that is unsure. We live with gracious gratitude in a world that is obsessive. We live with peace knowing we're accepted in a world that excludes. We live with boldness, the boldness of our calling in a world that is discouraged. We live with great abundance in a world that's on empty. Also, our commitments to walk worthy of the calling to which we are called are equally distinct and in sharp contrast to the driven world. As such, we display a unity that optimizes growth in a world that divides, daily renewal putting on a new self in a world that is stuck in corrupt, deceitful desires, purposeful holiness that pleases God and makes our days count in the fullness of the Spirit in a world of fruitless deeds and shameful practices, a reverence that respects and values others in a world that abuses and devalues others, the ability to stand firm in the strength of the Lord in a world that caves in. These 11 contrasts are so distinct that we can say we shine as light in a darkness of this world. Therefore, we not only show them the blessed of the life of those called out by Christ, we tell them how they can become what we are. As in Paul, the mystery of the gospel is revealed through us. We, we boldly proclaim it. Paul says that this begins in persevering prayer. My friends, we bring no one to Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We can only be, as Paul describes, ambassadors of Christ. John 15, 16 says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And yet we are his ambassadors. The Spirit works through us through the called out lives we lived and Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5.20 when he says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, although God was making his appeal through us. Our job is to faithfully live a called out life in a dark world, a life that displays all the spiritual blessings we looked at in the first three chapters. Our job is to focus our efforts on living out those six commitments that are in the last three chapters. And the Spirit's job is to use, use that to get, into, to get behind the defenses of the people around us, to use our contrasted life to let others know what it's like to live 
with and for Jesus. It's our persistent prayer that engages the Spirit to so work. Do you have someone you want to see come to the Lord? Are you persisting in prayer for them? If you do, the Spirit will lead you and you will have opportunity to share the gospel with them. Now, under the leading of the Spirit, sharing our faith is never forced. We live in this dark world, a greatly contrasted life, as I've been pointing out. And from time to time, those who see us will wonder why we're so different, and they'll ask us. And our task is simple. We recognize the Spirit has created a moment, and we listen carefully to their questions and concerns. And then we apply the truths of the gospel that specifically speak to their needs. We share with them the hope we have in Christ. We demonstrate out of our called out lives what it means to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and what is the immeasurably greatness of his power, of his power towards those of us who believe as wonderfully affirmed in chapter 1. And then do that and you'll experience the great joy of seeing someone you care about come to Christ. Now, Paul ends the letter saying this. So that you may also that you may also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Simply as verse 22 says, Paul wrote this letter to encourage us. And so to experience all the blessings of our loving Heavenly Father all the blessings he gives us in Christ vastly encourages us to see ourselves able to faithfully fulfill these commitments to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called encourages us to recognize that we can be imitators of God as beloved children walking in Christ-like sacrificial love encourages us in holy reverence acting in such a way that those we are with feel valued as we put their needs before our own, vastly encourages us, knowing we have the strength of the Lord to stand firm against all opposition encourages us. My friends, Ephesians is a very encouraging letter. Back in 1997, God opened the book of Ephesians to me. And at that time, I, I recognized and identified these six attitudes and these six commitments that we've been talking about that we frame our identity and we focus our efforts. For most of the last year, I've lived in the book of Ephesians. As we come to the end of our study, I've come to see that the first reason God opened this book to me is that I desperately needed it. In my formative years in my family, I was, came to see that or felt that I was inadequate and unlovable. And the shame of that drove me in a lot of the ways we've talked about in this class. It damaged me, it hurt my relationships. Now, through all of this, there was no question that I loved Jesus. And I was totally sold out to minister and serve his people. And I saw God greatly use me in the lives of others with great outcomes. Still, those drives controlled at times how I did life. Times I felt envious, insecure, obsessive, excluded, discouraged, and empty. They drove me to acts and ways that were not in the long-term best interest of myself or my family, my relationships. I needed that reframed identity as a cherished son of a loving Heavenly Father to take hold of the hope to which he calls us, to embrace the God who is rich in mercy, great in love, immeasurably great in grace and kind, and to live ever so grateful that he did for me what I could never do for myself. To know that I'm accepted and have unbroken access to the Father. To have confidence I can boldly carry out my calling in the eternal purposes of God and to be filled with all the surpassing love of Christ. This orphan needed to know he's been adopted into a wonderful family that has an incredibly caring father, a amazing big brother, and wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ. I needed to refocus my efforts less on meeting my own needs and more on meeting the needs 
of the people around me. I can't say how this study has affected you. All I know that God intentionally gifted me the insights into this book because I needed them. I needed to do more work on being less driven and more called out. To celebrate what it means to be called out in all the blessings that are in Jesus. To recognize I can live out those six commitments. This morning I just want to praise the Lord who knows just how to speak to us and just what we need to hear. <laughs> Paul sums up who we become as we live a called out life worthy of that calling. He says, peace be to all the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with an undying love. Our lives are energized, my friends, by the God who enables us to love him and each other who gives us his peace, gives us his faith, pours out his immeasurable grace on us and fills with us with the joy of loving Jesus with an undying love. Amen. Any questions or thoughts? That was one of the, that's probably the first two verses in Ephesians I memorized as a kid at 10 years old at a church camp. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I, and I've come to love the next verse, which says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's a wonderful letter. Any other questions or thoughts? Done. I think that Paul is a pretty amazing example here because as he said, the worst of all sinners, he suffered greatly. He was clearly the example of an amazing evangelist. He achieved the type of Christ he set for the sin, of course, but he suffered greatly and shared his faith like no other person in the New Testament. And he wrote some really good letters. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think if you, you know, one of the things I do when I'm studying scripture is to look for repetitions. And one of the repetitions in Ephesians is boldly. It's in chapter 3 and it's in chapter 6. And I think this is a letter that enables us to live boldly in this troubled, uncertain world. Any other questions, comments? I want to thank you so much for sticking with me all these weeks. Thank you for praying for me. I've needed it. And let's close in prayer.